So this is lecture 13 of ECE, um, ECE 503. Okay. So in this lecture, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about two topics. The first topic is about sampling and reconstruction of continuous time bandpass signals. The second topic afterwards is the construction of bandpass signals from low-pass signals and returning them back to low-pass signals. All right? So um, you know that the second guy is going to be all about modulation. Right? So I'm going to show how we can use modulation using cosine functions in order to take low-pass signal, bring it to bandpass, and then return it back to low-pass. But first things first, let me, let me kind of cheat. Okay? Like I, I'm not one for writing mystery novels. Right? I, 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 I write technically somewhat well, but writing mystery novels is not my thing. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the surprise out of lecture 13. As, as much as you guys want to see a surprise, and you know, it's late at night here and everything like that. So let's do the following. So let's have a flashback. So everyone should have remembered many, many moons ago that remember we had the following situation. So we had a situation where, let's say that's DC frequency, 0, right? And we had a cosine function that looked like this, right? We had uh, left cosine and right cosine, just like the commercial, left twix and right twix. Which one's better? You know. So what ended up happening is, remember that this guy had a certain bandwidth, bandwidth B. Um, and what we were concerned about is, what should Fs be? Right? We had to select it carefully, because what we want to do, ideally, is we want copies of this guy to be centered, like let's say that's your Fc, in this case it's 0, and then the next sampling frequency, let's say that's Fs, you have left, and let's get rid of this because, ah, no, 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 no. Ah, oh dear. And let's say you have right, and then let's say you have right, and then over here you have left. And that's centered at minus fs. And it goes on from plus, minus infinity to plus infinity. And we talked about, like, this here is OK, because, because there's no aliasing, right? No aliasing. So we're happy. And I talked about the case where, suppose instead, we have this situation. Here again, we have zero frequency. Here's left. Here's right. And what we could do is, nobody's using this empty spectra here. No siree. So why not put fs over here and minus fs over here? And now what we've got is we got left, we got right, we got this guy. Let's say that's right. And then this guy over here, let's say this is 2fs. We have left, we have right. So what we've got is these guys are actually switching roles. So they don't completely clear the bandwidth of the other guy. So what ends up happening is this is our bandwidth of the first signal. This is the bandwidth of the second signal. This is the bandwidth of, or replica, sorry. And then this is the next bandwidth of the next replica, and so on and so forth. Notice that these guys are overlapping. So if you had a dumb system, you had a system that was like not aware that there's this overlapping happening, right? You'll say, you might pick the wrong delta. Might not be a big deal, but, you know, because these are only deltas, right? But let's say they're more meaningful. Let's say they, they were actually two pairs, two bandpass signals, and they carry useful information, and you selected the wrong ones, right? What this lecture, what lecture 13 is going to be about, or is about, and again, I'll go in through the boring slides in a minute, but I really want to articulate is this is actually OK. This is OK as long, here's the caveat, so here's the but. But, this is OK, but you've got to be aware that the overlapping is occurring and that there are certain, like, you know, we'll come up with a range of possible FS values that do not obey Nyquist's frequency. So what was Nyquist? Nyquist was FS is greater than or equal to 2B, right? The bandwidth of the signal. 
I will show. And there's like, you know, and this is the thing. Several of you in my office hours are saying, I don't know where this equation comes from, from uh, Proacus and Manolacus. Or where does this thing come from? Or where does that thing come from? So the first, the, what I want to emphasize is you should always have a physical understanding of what these things mean. The equations, you can memorize equations, but it's risky. You've got to understand the physics behind the equation. So what I'm going to be discussing, like I'm going to show a bunch of equations and people say, well, wh wh why, why is it k minus 1? Why is it this? Take a step back. Understand the physics of the situation here. All right? But what we're going to find out with the examples in, lectures, in, in the lecture slides is that this is totally good under certain circumstances. I, so in other words, I don't necessarily need to obey this. I don't need to. Like, so this, this for sure will prevent aliasing. But what I'm going to show you is that you can actually, with bandpass filtering, uh, sorry, bandpass signals, you can actually, um, under certain circumstances, not satisfy this. You can go less than fs and still, like, you know, less than, sorry, less than 2b and still be good. All right? And how's that done? That's the easiest way to. So for instance, what ends up happening is we, like the example that you'll see in lecture 13 in a few minutes, what we had is some sort of waveform that looked like this. So this is no longer a delta. This is actually a signals located at, let's say, um, minus FC and FC, right? And suppose this is located at uh, minus 3b and minus 4b. And this is at 3b and that's at 4b and that's zero. What, what we can do is suppose I want to sample this guy. So if I do it conventionally, if I use Nyquist sampling, what this is going to look like, so this is your analog signal. Okay. What you're going to get when you sample this um, is the following. You're going to have zero. You're going to have this guy, right? So it's not drawn to scale. Sorry, folks. Um, and then you'll get a replica at fs, and it repeats here. Sorry. And same thing there at minus fs. And then this continues on from infinity to infinity, minus infinity to infinity. But notice the wasted space here, here, and here. I can do a little bit of trickery, right? What I could do is, why does fs need to be there? Why does, like, you know, what I could do is, could I fit, could I fit these replicas now inside these empty spaces here? And the answer is yes. So what you can do instead is, let's say we don't do Nyquist. Let's say we do something a little less than Nyquist. What I can conceivably do is I have zero, and here's my copy, and here's my other copy. And then suppose instead of there, what I can do is, let's say my fs is at this edge, and at this edge, and then multiples of that. What happens? What happens? So what would happen is I take this guy, and instead of shifting him all the way by twice the band, uh, bandwidth of this signal, so it would be located here, what I instead do, okay, get rid of that, I instead shift it half that distance to here, right? So what ends up we get instead, I know, this is the... I love that way of erasing, is do, 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 do. Okay. so we have minus fc, we have fc, and so now what we get is something that looks like this. And um, we have that guy there, and then likewise, this guy is going to look like that, and we'll have another guy out here. Now, what happens is now our periodic replica. So, so this is one copy, right? 
This is another copy, correct? This is another copy. Oh, but wait, there's more. There's going to be another copy over here. So now we got this guy, and there's going to be another, sorry, another copy there. And likewise, there's going to be this guy, and another copy there. And we just continuously stack these replicas within those empty spots. This is totally OK as long as you are, there's two factors. Your system knows, at the end of the day, where to extract replicas from. Very, very important. Because what happens is, as you will see again in, lecture thir in the lecture 13 slides, what we'll have is if you extract the wrong replica, you might have these guys flipped. You know? And then it's like, oh, holy smokes. What's going on? You know, so, so that's the one risk. You might be, just like before with the deltas, you have left and right. If you extract the wrong replica, for whatever reason, to do your signal processing on, you might be getting right instead of left, and, and left instead of right. The other thing is if, like, you know, here, I just arbitrarily chose fs at this boundary, right? I can choose any continuum of fs values, and I would get this. In this case, you know, it's decent. Maybe it's a little bit sloppy. Maybe I can bring these guys even closer together, right? Almost touching. Maybe I would like to have some spacing between them. But I could also choose FS values where the unfortunate happens and they start overlapping. When they start overlapping, game over. That's aliasing. Like that's, no, that's really serious aliasing. There's no way of recovering those exact symbols out from the spectra, right? So this is what I'm worried about. Suppose I incorrectly choose an FS. You know, I chose poorly. And what happens is, I have this, I have that, and lo and behold, let's suppose I, I choose an FS mm, over here, okay? And I choose a minus FS over there, and two FS and such, and what ends up happening is I get this. That is aliasing. That's un unrecoverable. That's a bad situation. And likewise, here aliasing. And then all the copies are going to alias, 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 alias. So when we try to recover, recovery, it's a bad answer. We won't get recovery because the two signals overlap with each other and we cannot extract the original signal, right? So that, so that, that's the first part of tonight's lecture. So now, now I'm just going to switch over to like, you know, the, uh, to the slides, but essentially, I, I, it should not be any surprise to anybody, like you know what I'm talking about. So, so let's 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 jump into it. So, you, what, what do you actually mean for for band limit signal? It's, there's not a that high sample frequency. <sighs> exactly. So the question is, for band limited s signals, we do not need a high sampling frequency. And the answer is absolutely correct. So when you have a band limited signal. Uh, you do have a lot of flexibility in terms of sampling at a much lower rate as long as you do not have your band limited signal overlap with its uh, periodic replicas. If that happens, game's over. But if you choose wisely, you can sample at a much lower rate, which means it would translate in terms of hardware costs to something much cheaper. And then at the end of the day, it's like you're, you're, doing, you're doing great. As long as your system also is able to recover that copy, the right copy from, from all that repli replicated spectra. Yep. Question. Exactly. Exactly. And there's an interesting plot that I doodled. It's actually in your textbook. And I thought, this stuff, this thing, other than looking like a spider or a hand and stuff, actually also graphically represents sort of like your bounds, if you will, for your implementation for doing slower than Nyquist sampling for band limited signals. So absolutely. So this, this translates into, um, in terms of cost, it's reduced cost because your hardware doesn't have to sample as much. And your system, as long as it's designed intelligently, can recover that signal. Exactly. Perfect question. So, OK. 
So this is so front the first slide. This is exactly you know what I've been ranting about for the last twenty minutes and such. And then this is what I was telling you about. So this is the drawing that I was doing. And what I really want to highlight, okay, several things. So first of all is recovery. So this is something that your system will need to do once you, you know, once you sample and everything. You want to extract the right replica for doing whatever sort of processing. And so here we use our ideal uh, bandpass filters, which we looked at in our last lecture, where we talked about bandpass, band reject, all pass low pass high pass filters and we know that we can create a band pass filter from a low pass filter which is represented here so what is a low pass filter in the time domain it's if it's ideal it's a, in the frequency domain it's rectangular and it's located at dc but in time domain it's a sync pulse and then how do we modulate in the time domain a signal you multiply it by a cosine with the appropriate frequency that you want to modulate it to so what you end up having is you have a sync pulse modulated by a cosine function, right? In the frequency domain, it's essentially the square wave, like this guy, centered at FC. And what does that guy do? He extracts the periodic replica, a periodic replica, the one that we want to work with, right? So, and then the things we need to be careful about is taking the wrong ones, like this guy, right, or that guy. What we want to do is we want to extract the right one, and so the system has to be knowledgeable about it. Okay. And so, this is the thing I was telling you guys about. Okay. So, so what happens is, if you're dealing with a band-limited, band-pass signal, and what you're trying to do is sample slower than Nyquist. You can choose any sampling frequency range. Well, not any. You can choose from a, a continuum of frequency sampling values. But the problem is, you've got to be very careful. So this is one of those equations that people say, what, 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 what does that mean? And what this equation just means is, you have a certain range where you can choose FS that you can sample slower than Nyquist. And if you, if you know what the lower frequency and higher frequency of your bandpass signal is, you can fit this FS in this range. And what this tells me is that I will not cause any overlapping of any of the replicas with each other if I choose this FS. Right? So again, like, you know, the, 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 the equation is, how the heck did he get that? Where did the k minus 1 come from and all that jazz? So let me, let me explain. So let's go back to PowerPoint. So what this means is, if we go back to our example, right? So you have here f, l, and f, h. We have minus FL and minus FH. So what I want to do is I want to find conditions. I want to find out if I had to decide on a sampling frequency, right? And I'm not going to go crazy and do FS is greater than 2B, right? I'm not going to do that here. What I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to choose a location of FS, right? And it's going to be mirrored here minus fs, and then we know that it's going to come every 2fs, 3fs, and so on, right? And same thing there, minus 2fs, and so on. What we want to do is I want to be very careful that my periodic replica, this guy here, and my periodic replica here, and all periodic, periodic replicas after that, you know, if depending on where my fs is located, my periodic replica can either move there or there, there or there. And what I want to make sure is that it doesn't go into the other replica. And same thing here. So what I want to do is I want to find out what range of S FS values I can choose, which would dictate the location here and here and here and here and here, such that when, let's say, if I move this a little bit further away, this FS, right? 
this replica will start moving closer to this guy. And that replica is going to start moving closer to this guy. I want to find where's the limit. Where can I essentially say, no more, I'm not going to go any further because then I'm going to start overlapping. So intuitively, where, where would that be? And one of those limits is FL. So what we want to do is set a bound where we say, OK, um, one obvious location is 2FL, right? So what happens is, suppose we have FS, and suppose that FS is equal to 2FL. How did I choose that? Well, first of all, um, what I'm looking at is um, if, let's say, it's any further right, than 2FL, so that's FL, and then 2FL would be there. God, I maybe I should clean that up. So 2FL would be there. And then if I move a periodic replica and I center it around there, I'm guaranteed not to over, overlap with, start overlapping with this guy. And then the other limit that you guys saw, the 2FH, that's sort of like, you know, so 2FH, we can start our sampling frequency there and continue up to 2 bandwidth, right? Twice the bandwidth. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a zone of don't touch in terms of the sampling frequency. So I can either have a sampling frequency that goes up to 2FL, or I can have a sampling frequency that must be greater than 2FH all the way up to twice the bandwidth of the entire signal, right? And the reason for that is I want to avoid having any replicas overlap with that bandpass signal. So if we go back, I love that sound. If we go back to, oh, no, sorry, that's another lecture. Oop. So if we go back to this, this is exactly what I was talking about. What we've got here is that limit. And then we were talking about, so in the notes, what we're thinking about is, can we set up some base unit of FS that is an integer multiple? So we choose some integer K. And can we choose a k where this is going to be good at k equals 1, k equals 2, k equals 3? So what we're looking at is, can we choose this fs where even the multiples of S, fs, the integer multiples of S, fs, are still good in terms of avoiding aliasing, and we can still stack it in, uh, in the spectra? And so this is the situation where we want to avoid overlapping with this guy. So this expression here tells me how to avoid it, right? And then you have something called k max, which tells you uh, the maximum number of multiples of, of that fs that we are allowed before what we, we kind of run into, um, into overlapping with that replicas. And the diagram that you have in your book, this is actually a beautiful diagram. It will take, so, so what are we looking at here? It kind of looks like a hand, right? So, no. What this guy here tells me is this is the ratio of FS over the bandwidth of your signal. So this tells me, this tells me uh, how, how many, uh, like, you know, um, so what we normally know from Nyquist is that this should be, um, FS should be twice the bandwidth. So what ends up happening is we can, what this allows us to do is uh, how, how, how many replicas we can cram into that empty space uh, in, in between the band, limit, uh, the band pass uh, signals in our transmission or, or signal in general. And so what this does is this guy sets the bounds, if you will, where we can have an FS anywhere in here relative to the bandwidth of your signal, right? So this is for k equals 1 that multiple, k equals 2, k equals 3, k equals 4, and so on. This region here, these sure shaded regions that I've drawn here, represent FS values that we cannot use because we get aliasing. So anywhere in that white space, any FS value 
It doesn't necessarily need to be an integer multiple of b. Any fs value relative to b, as long as it's represented in the white space, okay, and then the, the bottom axis is with respect to the highest frequency of our bandpass signal, normalized by the bandwidth. So we're normalizing everything here by the bandwidth of the entire signal, right? That includes the empty white space in between. What happens is anywhere that's white, we're allowed to choose that fs, given the upper limit fh. Anywhere that's shaded, can't touch. Not allowed, because we'll have aliasing. And so that's what those floor functions and those uh, sort of like bounds that I showed on the previous slide, the actual equations mean. But what this guy tells me is I cannot choose an fs that's located here or here or here or here or here or here because what happens is I'm going to get overlapping replicas. But I can totally choose one here or here or here depending on what sort of integer multiple of fs I'm going to be using um, in order to stack those replicas in that empty space, right? And then what happens is we have, like, you know, there is a practical operating point. So suppose you have this don't touch region, this don't touch region, that don't touch region, and so on and so forth. And we know that signals and spectra are not ideally band limited. They do go on a little bit. Where do we ideally want to operate? Where do we want our FS to really be? as far away from those don't touch regions as possible. We want one to be here. We probably want one to be over here. So as far away from those regions. Another one over here. So that's what this graph is representing. We essentially want to be located in a nice buffer region away from all those don't touch areas. All right? OK. So that's the first part of lecture um, law. Lecture 13. The second part of lecture 13 is this guy here. Bandpass signal representation. So if you play with communication theory like I do, or just in general, if you want to relate low pass filters as bandpass filters, you're going to need to use something like this. Okay? So again, continuous time signal. Um, we want a bandpass signal. How do we make a bandpass signal from a low pass signal? We modulate it. We just saw it, right? You take low pass filter, modulated by the cosine to the desired center frequency, and now you've got a modulated low pass fil filter, and now it's band pass. And you can do the same thing with signals. So that's what we've got here. Through Euler's relationship, we know that these are complex exponentials. But let's, let's, let's take a different tack. Let's look at this differently, right? Because, you know, we all love math, right? Yay, math. No. So what happens is, suppose we have Euler, and Euler is great, but I want to simplify things. What's another way of representing this? The idea here is, instead of having two complex exponentials, this is equivalent to taking the real, two times the real, of one of the complex exponentials. Right? Do the math. How do you get a real? You take this guy, and then add to it its complex conjugate and divide by 2. And that will give you the real portion of this complex function, which is what you got on top, right? So I got the exact same thing. So, so no, I'm not pulling anything out of my sleeves. This, this is legit. OK, so now here's all the math. So what we instead want to do is we, let's, let's see where this takes us. So suppose we have that sort of um, uh, formulation, uh, where we know that we, we can take 2 times the real of a complex value, um, uh, in this case was a, a complex exponential, and that will give us a cosine. Well, let's look at, in the generic case, let's take here, in this case, it's a Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transform, of a continuous time frequency response, and we want to bring it to a continuous time time domain uh, function, in this case, uh, x a of t. So this is a continuous time inverse Fourier transform. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to split up this inter integral into two halves. 
I'm doing nothing, right? This is almost like a Seinfeld episode. I'm doing nothing. But what happens is what I'm going to do is instead of having an integral from minus infinity to infinity, I'm instead going to take an integral from zero to infinity and another portion from minus infinity to zero and add two integrals together. I've done absolutely nothing. This, these two left and right hand sides are identical to each other. I'm going to play a little trick. Still doing nothing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a change of variables. I'm going to let the second guy, instead of being f, I'm going to replace all instances of f with minus f. And if there's df, now it's going to be minus df. And what we're going to find, it turns out, the second guy looks almost like the first guy except that we have an e to the minus j 2 pi f of t, and the frequency response x a of f is now a complex conjugate. And that should be no surprise. That's a property of the Fourier transform, right? Yes? Yes. The, the idea of reverse integral is to check. Well, there, there's a minus. I think there's another minus in there somewhere. Otherwise, this, this would not pan out. Let me, let me double check that. But I think, um, like, you're right. Like when you do the df, that an, uh, it will be, will be now minus df. Um, the, 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 the integral, what happens is the trick there is it's going to be minus f is equal to minus infinity, which will now be f is equal to infinity. And then minus f equals 0 will still be f equals 0. Um, however, I think there's one more place where um, there might be a minus popping up. But I'll, I'll double check that. That's a good question. So then what happens is this here, like you know, if we take this one step further, this guy we know is just a complex conjugate version of that guy, and that's equal to a real function. And so what happens is we have this expression here, and this, this guy inside the real, real operator, we give him a, a function name. We call him phi a of t. This phi a of t is called the analytical signal, um, or pre-envelope. And then that pre-envelope is kind of interesting. So what we want to do is this pre-envelope what is he? And it turns out that this pre-envelope is kind of like the Fourier, the, the inverse Fourier transform of x a of f, but not quite. What's the difference about this guy? The integral is from 0 to infinity rather than minus infinity to infinity. So there needs to be some sort of unit step function in there. Right? And that unit step function, it turns out, we're going to call it v a of f. So in the frequency domain, that's our unit step function. So anything less than 0, f less than 0, the function 0. Anything greater than 0, f greater than 0, we have x a of f. If we take the inverse Fourier transform of v a of f, this gives us a delta and this funny sort of uh, thing at the end, j over 2 pi t. And it turns out that this j over 2 pi t has a very interesting property. All right? So this j over 2 pi t, when we convolve, like, so, so let's say we make this guy a filter. Let's say, forget about, let's get rid of the j. This 1 over pi t, we call it, let's say we have it as a function. So we're convolving it. And, like, going back to this guy, Notice that this is the product of two frequency, frequency functions, frequency r responses. What is that in the time domain? It's a convol convolution of their time domain equivalents. So what we've got here now is x a of t convolved with this thing. What is this thing? It turns out that this is a Hilbert transform. You might have heard of it. So what does the Hilbert transform do? What the Hilbert transform does First of all, it creates this x a of t hat, right? 
and that's what we create this envelope function with. But what this guy does, okay, is what it will do is when we convolve it, it, prov it, prov um, it generates this sort of like complementary function to x a of t. And at the end of the day, what, what we can use that guy for when we do the math is it allows us to create these relationships between x and uh, polar, uh, polar representations. So we have a of t, where in this case we have either an imaginary and real component of x, right? So, and, and that's derived from a low pass equivalent, right? And so we have our envelope and we have our phase. And then from that, what happens is we have our in phase, so x i of t, and has an envelope and a cosine modulation. And we have a quadrature representation, which is the envelope and sine modulation. And the reason why we call it in phase and quadrature is because cosine and sine are orthogonal to each other, right? And then to get the envelope, what we do is we take x i of t and we take x q of t, and we take the squares of the two and add them together and take the square root, and we take the arctangent of the in phase and the, and, the, and the quadrature with each other, and that yields the phase and uh, magnitude response. And what we're doing here, essentially, is from all of this, what we can do is the following. Is from that, you, you can take your analog time domain waveform, multiply one with cosine, the other one with sine, and so we're essentially modulating it with fc. We low pass filter it, and that gives us x i of t, x q of t. And then if we want to recover x a of t, we do the exact, op we just basically repeat the process. We multiply it again by cosine and sine and sum them together. So that Hilbert transform, what it does, what it does is it, it makes your phase 90 degrees shifted. It keeps your response, the magnitude response, the same, but it changes your phase by 90 degrees. So a very powerful result. All right. So that really concludes lecture 13. So from this lecture, what did we learn? So what we, what we saw is, first of all, that if we have a band pass signal that's very band limited, that we can sample less than the Nyquist sampling rate and still be able to have no aliasing and have those period, re, periodic replicas. We can fir, filter out a replica and return it back to, let's say, whatever waveform we want without any distortion if we play our cards right, if we choose FS to be just right. And we also saw sort of how to avoid these regions of F, FS values that potentially could mess us up, could cause aliasing. And then what we saw was how we can have a band pass signal representation using, um, in this case, in phase and quadrature representations, which are essentially low pass signals that we modulate using cosine and sine, and how to recover that back to a low pass representation. OK, so that concludes lecture 13. All right, so while this thing is wrapping up, what we'll do is we'll take a